Hi guys, my name is Sanjay Gupta. I'm a consultant cardiologist in York. Today's video is on the subject of pace and ablate. Um, this is a video which is particularly relevant to those people who suffer from atrial fibrillation. So let's get started. Uh, the first thing to say is atrial fibrillation is a heart rhythm disturbance. But not only is it a rhythm disturbance, but it is also a rate disturbance, meaning that when you go into a fib, not only does the heart beat irregularly, but it can beat excessively fast or excessively slow. When the heart is beating excessively fast, two things can happen. The first is, when a person goes into atrial fibrillation and if the heart beats very fast, then the patient generally tends to be more symptomatic. They tend to have more in the way of palpitation, breathlessness, dizziness, tiredness, effort intolerance. So that's one problem with the heart racing when a person goes into atrial fibrillation. The second problem, if the heart races, is that the patient may, over a period of time, develop a condition called tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy, meaning that the heart is beating fast, it's beating irregularly and fast, and when it's beating fast, it is beating faster than the body's demands placed on it, so it's beating unnecessarily fast. And in so doing, what can happen is that the atria are beating away, the ventricles are listening to the atria, and the, because the ventricles are beating fast in response to the atria, the ventricles can start weakening over a period of time. This is called tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy. The good news is that if the ventricles start weakening over a period of time, and if you can then control the rate, this tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy can be reversible. But it's quite nice to not to get there in the first place. So wherever possible, it's important when a person is in atrial fibrillation to try and control the heart rate um, so that you don't develop this tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy and also the patient feels better if their rate is controlled when they're in, in an irregular rhythm. So what strategies do we have to tr try and control the heart rate? Well, the obvious way is to try and get them out of atrial fibrillation. If they're not in atrial fibrillation, their heart is not irregular and it's not going to beat very fast. And so often we can try and get the patient out of atrial fibrillation either by doing something called a cardioversion, a shock treatment to the heart under general anesthetic, or an ablation. However, in some patients, these strategies do not work. Uh, these are patients in whom the atrial fibrillation has been long-standing, it's persistent, or they have uh, atria which are very big and flabby. So despite our best efforts, you can't simply can't get them back into a regular rhythm. Um, so what then? Well, in those people where you just cannot get them into a regular rhythm, you try medications to control the heart rate. Uh, commonly used medications include beta blockers, calcium antagonists, digoxin. The problem is that beta block these medications have side effects. So it is not po sometimes it's just not possible for the patient to tolerate these medications because of side effects. Also, sometimes you can give them everything and they can still uh, you can you may still not be able to control the rate adequately. Uh, and therefore, despite all these medications, the patient is still symptomatic with the fast heart rate, but also he has the risk of developing tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy. So in those patients, there is another way of trying to make things a bit better. And one way you can control the heart rate in patients who are in atrial fibrillation is mechanically. And I'll talk you through this. This is what pace and ablate is about. It is about how you control the heart rate in patients with atrial fibrillation without using medication. So the way to try and understand what pace and ablate is is this. The first thing to say is that the impulses in the atria are uh, usually transmitted down and the ventricles listen to what the atria are doing and the ventricles respond to the atria. So if the atria are beating very fast, uh, the impulses will go down. They'll go down this structure called the AV node and the AV node slows everything down. It's a bit like um, if a car is going down a bridge, it's like the toll booth um, you know, on the bridge. So all the cars are going really fast, but then they have to slow down. And then the AV node will let these impulses go through. If your atria beating really, really fast, 
then not all the impulses from the atria will get down to the ventricles because of the AV node, because it'll only allow some of those impulses through. Uh, so in atrial fibrillation, the atria could be beating at 400 beats per minute, but the ventricle will not beat at 400 beats per minute because the AV node stops these impulses coming through. So the ventricles would beat at 160 to 180 beats per minute. The problem is even 160 to 180 beats per minute is incredibly unsettling for the patient and can make the patient feel very symptomatic and of course can cause this tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy if left unchecked for a prolonged period of time. So um, one way that you can control the heart rate of the ventricles is to mechanically ablate the AV node. So if you induce a complete block between the atria and the ventricles, the impulses from the atria will not be able to get down to the ventricles because this AV node has been blocked. Uh, and so in that setting, what happens? Well, it's not that the ventricles, because they're not getting any impulses, they don't just stop. Different parts of the heart are capable of developing their own or generating their own electricity. So the ventricles will generate their own electricity and will continue to beat. The problem is that the intrinsic rate of this electricity is about 40 beats per minute or so. So this is called an escape rhythm. Um, so you block the AV node, the ventricles will then start generating their own electricity and will beat it around about 40 beats per minute. The problem with that, however, is that uh, 40 beats per minute may not be enough to sustain the patient uh, and to allow them to do their day-to-day -day activities. So 40 beats per minute is enough to keep someone alive, but if they start walking, etc., you want the heart rate to go up to get more blood round, and 40 beats per minute is just not enough. So in that setting, what doctors do is they then put a pacemaker into the ventricles, and the pacemaker tells the ventricles how uh, fast to beat. So you program the rate in the pacemaker, and now what will happen is if you say program a rate of 60 beats per minute, the pacemaker will, will fire and the ventricle will beat at 60 beats per minute. So in some ways, the ventricles have stopped listening to the atria, and now they're going to listen to the pacemaker. So the ventricular rate goes down to whatever you set it at, and the ventricles beat regularly, right? Before they were beating irregularly because they were listening to all these irregular pulses coming from the atria. Now you've blocked the connection and the, the pacemaker will fire regularly. So the ventricular rate is regular. And this is the fundamental um, principle behind this idea of pace in the blade. It seems very drastic when you think about it that someone's going to block this connection and put in a pacemaker. However, when we look at all the research, we see that th there's some very interesting things. Um, number one, pace and ablate is a very effective strategy at controlling the heart rate. Number two, those people who do want to go pace and ablate report less hospitalization, less physician visits, less reliance on medications, improvement in heart function if they've developed a tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy, and finally, they report an improved quality of life. Obviously, one of the worries is if you're letting people do things in your heart, could that affect your prognosis in a bad way? And all the studies so far have not shown that pace and ablate seems to that it worsens prognosis. So it doesn't appear that pace and ablate makes a difference to lifespan. It doesn't improve it. It doesn't seem to worsen it from the studies we have so far but it does seem to improve quality of life, all right? Now, um, what about one of the big concerns? It's just worth also noticing how effective is it? Well, AV node ablation, ablating the AV node is very effective, but in about 3 to 4% of patients, you may have a recurrence, in which case you may need another procedure. One of the biggest concerns patients have is, look, I'm now going to be pacemaker dependent because my ventricles are listening to the pacemaker. What will happen if for any reason the pacemaker stops working? You know, will I die? And the answer is not quite. It's not like that. What will happen is, the first thing is the chances of a pacemaker failing are very low because whenever you have a pacemaker put in, someone will keep a very close watch on it. They'll get early signals that the battery is uh, beginning to uh, become depleted, in which case someone will replace the batteries well in advance. But let's imagine a scenario where in some way the pacemaker gives up. 
Well, what happens then is dependent on whether you have an escape rhythm or not, meaning that let's say there's no impulses coming through from the atria and the pacemaker isn't working, will your ventricle generate an intrinsic escape rhythm? And uh, there's been a study, there was a study done, I think in 2000 in the American uh, Heart Journal, which showed that the majority of patients with pace and ablate still have an intrinsic rhythm ranging between 11 to 65 beats per minute. But usually this intrinsic rhythm is no more than 40 beats per minute. So if the pacemaker suddenly fell, the patient wouldn't die, uh, but they wouldn't like it because their heart would only be beating at 40 beats per minute. They'll feel a bit, they, they, may, they may be okay when they're sitting there, but if they walked or did something, they wouldn't be feeling as good, which is okay because by that time you have enough time to get to a hospital and someone can replace the battery or fix the pacemaker, etc. So it's not a catastrophe in the majority of cases. If you had no underlying rhythm, then there was a pro then there would be a problem. But generally, that's uncommon. It's generally people do have some kind of escape rhythm. They may feel awful when their heart goes at say 20 beats per minute in this escape rhythm, but they'll still um, it'll still be enough to hopefully keep them going until that they can get someone to fix it. Um, so that is the that is the fundamental idea of pace and ablate. One of the other things to bear in mind is that. A lot of times there has been a concern that if you are now dependent on the pacemaker and the pacemaker is firing all the time, people worry that that in itself can weaken the heart because the heart is now reliant on the pacemaker and can that weaken the heart. Well, most of the evidence points to the fact that that happens if you've already got a weak heart to start off with. But now what they're beginning to do is they're beginning to put in these things called biventricular pacemakers, which work and try and activate both of the ventricles, you know, all of the heart to contract at the same time. Remember, if you've got a pacemaker in, you're stimulating one bit of that pacemaker of that heart first, and therefore you're inducing a little bit of dyssynchrony, meaning one part of the heart's going to contract a little bit earlier than the other part, and therefore you're not going to get as effective a contraction because the bit that's contracting first is going to you know, there's going to be a dyssynchrony. Uh, but now um, the common um, the common strategy is to put in these biventricular pacemakers, which aim to make all of the heart contract more effectively. And those seem to be very well tolerated and seem to be good in, in the long term compared to single chamber pacemakers. So, you know, yes, pace and ablate is uh, a little bit drastic. It may seem a little bit drastic, but it does... Uh, it can substantially improve quality of life in those people whose hearts are going very fast and who are intolerant or don't want to take medications for a prolonged period of time. So I hope you found this useful. I would love to hear your comments. As you can see, my hair is growing and I really need to go and get it cut. So um, now that they're going to lift the lockdown, I hope I'll, <laughs> I hope I'll be more presentable next time. Uh, once again, thank you so much for everything uh, you do for me. I am incredibly grateful um, for all the, all the wonderful comments. Uh, you guys rock. Thank you so much. All the best.